you're watching Faith and Reason. A discussion about God, politics, and pop culture. From the perspective of our pastors, who are not afraid to tackle and ask the hard questions. A Christian talk show for those on a spiritual journey. This is Faith and Reason. Good evening. Welcome to Faith and Reason, a show that looks at issues that are going on in today's society in light of the Word of God. I'm Pastor George Crespo from First Baptist Church in Cliffside Park. And with me as always, Pastor Rick Spence from Four Lead Gospel. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Um, tonight we want to tackle a different kind of topic, uh, one that certainly um, Pastor Rick and I deal with on a much more common level than most people, but it's becoming something that people are more aware of these days. And certainly with all the terrorist things happening, shootings, you know, um, things that have been going on in society, people begin to fear the possibility that something may happen to them, that they may encounter, you know, death in one way or another or some sort of tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, yet for us, of course, it's a very common thing because we do funerals where we're constantly exposed to, to the reality of life, that mm -hmm. it ends in death. Mm -hmm. And yet most people walk around as if um, everything is fine, everything is dandy, mm -hmm. there's no problem for them. And um, it's just very much of the matrix of, of their existence. Um, and, of course, we want to begin with this, uh, with this idea of uh, are we really safe or is this just a great illusion? Where do we get this illusion from? Well, you, you know, I, I guess for the most part, um, you know, you have a better chance of surviving the day than being killed every day you live just because we live an awful lot of days in this life. And yet... And yet there's also the other side of it is that people have a tendency to believe they're going to live forever. They're going to believe that nothing bad's going to happen to them. So, um, so it's a combination. I, I think sometimes we fear the wrong things. We're, we're more afraid of, of terrorists than we are of uh, a heart attack, as an example. Uh, but there's a, you know, a thousand time better chance that you and I would die of a heart attack than us being killed by a terrorist. So, uh, so we're afraid of the terrorists. We're afraid of the bombing at the airport when we have to travel somewhere. We're afraid of the plane going down. And meanwhile, we're, we're not afraid of uh, the things that we should be concerned about. We're not afraid of, uh, you know, of, of the many ways that people die all the time. Well, yeah. may, maybe in part, you know, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking maybe part of the reason we're like that is because we're feeding this based upon what we're watching in the news. Oh, mm -hmm. someone walks into a theater and shoots people and stuff. So we're thinking... Right. Oh, we're going to go see a movie, and we're afraid that yeah, I'm going to find I'm going to see go see uh, Finding Dory, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. someone's going to gun me down. Uh, but you never hear in the news. Oh, uh, John was eating peanut butter and jelly, and he had a heart attack, and yeah, was we don't yeah. hear that on the news uh, while we're he's not, watching Dory you know, in the theater. You weren't watching Dory. <laughs> yeah, while he was watching Dory, he got shot. But if right. he guys a heart attack, we don't we don't really hear about those things unless someone passed away, of course. <laughs> you know, someone famous, of course, passed away. Mm -hmm. and, and then we, you know, like Muhammad Ali or uh, right. Eli Weisel, Weasel, who just, Weisel, who just passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that, we might be exposed to that. But other than that, we really don't. Um, yeah. So maybe it's because it's not a common thing that we're exposed to every day. Just like us, we know we're exposed to funerals, so we know. Mm -hmm. We know that a 15-year-old can die just as a 51-year-old can die. Right, right. And we have no illusion of that, that these things do happen. Um, but yet, we, they do. Um, why do people in society, you know, why is it that they avoid the thought of death? And how, and how is it they're able to, you know, again, persistently live every day without thought of it? Well, I, I think if, you know, there's a, there's a few ways you could answer that. On the one hand, if we're constantly thinking about our own death, we would become very depressed. We would, we would, tend to not really live, I, or, or we would think we would be depressed if we thought about it. Um, although, from experience, a lot of funeral directors I've met have been full of life, and some of them uh, have got a great sense of humor, and, and they're not depressed because they work for a funeral home. You know, they, they deal with death every day. Every day they go to work, and there's a dead body, or there's people grieving, and yet they're still filled with life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's the first issue, and, and the second uh, it really plays into, you know, you know, our our territory is that when you resolve your future, you resolve your life after death, and how you understand that, and the Bible teaches a, a heaven and a hell, and and if you uh, wrestle with that and come to a pace of peace and say, well, 
if I die, I'm in a better place, then it, it allows you to think more openly mm -hmm. about it as well. That's another side of it. And again, even though they may be exposed to it in some ways, I mean, we're talking, we're having, a, when we're having lunch about even children watching, you know, like Bambi's mother getting killed or mm -hmm. uh, the situation with the Lion King where his father dies, you know, and, and yet it's not portrayed in such a vivid way where children are pushed on that. But obviously it is being, it, it is introduced. I remember when I was in school when we had to read uh, Leo Tolstoy's uh, Ivan Ilyich. Uh, how, you know, it was a great, besides being a great story, it was one of those things where n nobody wanted to confront the idea mm. because they didn't want to confront the fact that him being dead is the fact that I could be dead, mm. which we see in a, I mean, I'm sure we can share stories as well. When we're in a funeral home, we're doing a funeral. Everybody's talking about everything mm. but the body right there. Right. You're talking about baseball, jokes, you know, the market, anything. Mm -hmm. But, and yet there's this body, a dead body of a person who was just alive yesterday, uh, walking around. Here they are in a casket, and people don't want to talk about that. And then once you come to a moment of a meditation or uh, a sermon or something, then they change their, their, uh, their posture. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you're finished, they want to, they want to talk about something else. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're constantly living in, in this state of, uh, not, a state of denial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely, and, uh, and, and it's a coping mechanism. Uh, we don't want to think that, uh, you know, that it's going to be us one day in the casket, and uh, many people try to avoid that thought. Uh, and, and clearly, um, you know, I, I think the exception to it can be uh, when young people are faced with death, sometimes it's almost overwhelming. Like the grief is, uh, is immense, you know, when a young person dies or, or even even an older person who dies and, and then you see the grandchildren, they're the only ones crying there because they're, they're not accustomed to death. They haven't lived long enough and, uh, and, and life tends to teach you. The older you get, the more funerals you go to, the closer you, you come to, uh, to facing your own mortality and, uh, and it does change your perspective somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly families that have been in one way or another um, not exposed to it. Like mm -hmm. myself, I've not been exposed to it simply because of the fact, I mean personally, mm -hmm. because of the fact that we we left our country when I was five years old, um, we only have this small nucleus of family here mm -hmm. and none of them have died. Okay. So we really don't have that experience yet. Uh, yeah. But yeah, large families that you know, you know your aunt, your uncles, you're all together, yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly it, it ex exposes you quicker right. to that reality, to that that for right. me is not, except for being a minister and right. doing funerals, I've not been exposed yeah, on yeah. a personal level yeah. to yeah. those things. You know, you know, sometimes just, I mean, you remind me of uh, a story. When I was 12 years of age, I had a, a cousin who we would call him ADHD today, but he was very hyper. And, uh, and um, I remember he was killed in an accident. I was 12, he was 12. Um, I remember... Uh, being offered his clothing, he was a little bit taller than I was, and and I said, no, I can't do that. I can't wear, you know, wear my cousins, you know. But but I I would even argue today, I probably would not be a minister, you know, if that experience had not been a part of my childhood. Uh, it's almost like the the issue of uh, becoming face to face with death. And I remember a psychology class that says until someone is 12 years of age, they can't even understand the difference between dying or moving to Florida. You know, the, you know, a child says, okay, well, someone's just gone. Mm -hmm. They're just gone. But, uh, but by age 12, 13, you're able to process the difference yeah, yeah. of what death makes. And, and I was right at that critical stage. And, and I remember that, that experience never left me. And, and people are dying. And people, uh, you know, uh, it, it is important how you live. And that's been a, a motivator for, for me even to, to go to seminary, to prepare for ministry, and, and to, to be a pastor today. So um, there's a... And, and a lot of good can come out of death, too. That's mm -hmm. the, the other side of it. Now, uh, obviously, the Bible has a great deal to say about death, dying, mm -hmm. um, about and how to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ecclesiastes, of course, is notorious as this book of uh, a man who's uh, consumed in that pessimism of all his vanity and yet trying to find meaning in life. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate upon that and tell us um, you know, how, how does he approach life? How does he view that? And how does he view death and dying. And, and then I want to quote uh, two, yeah, yeah. two yeah, passages good, good. here. Yeah, no, uh, Book of Ecclesiastes, and, and if, if anyone is philosophically bent, that's a great book to read. 
if you like philosophy and uh, and and so Solomon, uh, you know, the king of Israel, he's the one that writes Ecclesiastes. And basically, you know, the, the argument in the early chapters is, you know, I, I pursued all these different things that life had to offer. Uh, you know, pursued, uh, you know, my work. I pursued, uh, you know, building things. I pursued, uh, he even talked about his harem in there. His, uh, pleasure, man. Just uh, say the word pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure. You know, I drank alcohol, but it's my like, mind I'm is... Like, I'm talking to like a, a mega conservative person here. Like, oh, let's not say the word. Yeah, can I Sexual say... Sexual things. Can I say yeah. the word harem oh, on TV? You, you say, <laughs> ha- harem, say sex, and that'll, that'll be scandalous Okay, okay, right sex. There. Okay, anyways. He's so turning he, he red. Pursues, Look at exactly, exactly. Okay. So... I, <laughs> so he pursues all these different things, and at the end of the day, he says, all is vanity. And, uh, you know, the ultimate, you know, answer to life mm. is to a relationship with God and honoring God. And, and if God blesses you with, uh, you know, with a job you can enjoy and, mm. and the family you appreciate and, uh, and a good night's rest, you should be thankful for that. So, but in the midst of that, there's a, a great passage in Ecclesiastes 7 that addresses the yeah. death issue. You want to go there, there? There was two verses I wanted to quote because I've recently been listening to, to Ecclesiastes. It said, uh, in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2 says, It is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. And then in verse 4 it says, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, again, I think that people look at death incorrectly because death should make you see what is worth, worthwhile in life. Mm-hmm. You should be able to look at death and say, I'm going to die. How should I live? What should mm-hmm. I live for? Right. How should I conduct myself? Right, right. You know, one of my favorite quotes is, um, is a quote that said that uh, no businessman on, on his deathbed said, oh, I should have spent more time in the office. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it's that moment when they realize you neglected your wife, you neglected your family, you neglected the things that were most, most important, most dear in life. Uh, but why should we have to wait to that moment mm-hmm. to realize that? If we could mm-hmm. see it now, yep. if we could realize now I'm going to die, how do I live? I think that will radically, that will radically change us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think about 9-11 when, uh, you know, this impacted people who were making a lot of money, lower Manhattan, obviously the World Trade Center, and uh, there were people who lost friends there and, and associates, and, and some people just said, it's not worth it. I'm going to sell uh, my, my house. I'm going to you know, get off the rat race. I'm going to move to Colorado and live off the land or do something simple or become a school teacher because more meaningful. doesn't pay as well, but it's more meaningful. Whatever it was, mm. People changed their priorities. Why? Because they were faced with the reality of death. They knew people who died. They were impacted by uh, the sadness of 9-11, and, and there were changes. Uh, most people, you know, when they came home, they survived it, even covered in ashes. Mm. They went home and they hugged their kids because they say, what's important? It's, it's family. And uh, yeah. some people went back to church. Some people said, I need to revive my faith. Why? Because uh, they were faced with death. And uh, those are all important issues. Well, we're going to take a small break and uh, after this commercial. Welcome back to Faith and Reason. You saw a clipping there from Fort Lee Gospel. And certainly, if you're in the area, you should uh, go and worship, uh, worship the Lord and serve God in, in that wonderful church. Uh, you're also welcome to come and worship and serve uh, with us. And we're at First Baptist. We're at 777 Anderson Avenue in Cliffside Park. Our service is at 11 a.m. We also have a Wednesday night prayer meeting at 7.30 p.m. where we study the Bible as well. Uh, you can go to our Facebook, uh, or you can go to firstbathcp.org. You can see all the sermons, all the Bible studies, and even faith and reason, and um, get yourself involved in, in these things, these discussions. And today, of course, we're talking about uh, the illusion of safety, people feeling that um, everything is fine, and yet we know everything is not fine. We know, of course, that um, bad things do happen, and they happen on a daily basis. And they may not happen to us for a long time, but eventually they will happen to us as well. Um, you know, one of the things I want to talk about was, you know, um, dealing with tragedy, there's always this chemistry. I mean, one thing I dislike, I mean, and no offense to other Christians, I dislike when certain Christians kind of rejoice in the fact that it wasn't them, but someone else. <laughs> you know, there was a song years ago when I was a kid about, you know, uh, kind of feed the world type, you know, and part of the song said, uh, tonight, thank God it's them instead of you. 
Mm. And I thought, no, of course mm. not. Mm. That's horrendous. How could right. I be thankful to God that it's happening in Africa or it's happening over there, but that I'm spared from mm. it? I thought that was a horrific right. type of prayer. Right. But certainly, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with, you know, one family, uh, you know, a group of children go somewhere and X amount of families lose their 15-year-olds and X amount don't lose them, and yet they all claim mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. How do we cope with that? Yeah, no, it's, um, well, th there's a certain mystery, and uh, when we come to death, there, there's never concrete answers for all the questions that are, arise out of it, especially with a, a tragedy of a younger person. Um, you know, I, I actually had a, a friend in Canada who uh, was driving a car at, as a teenager, and he became the lone survivor. Three others perished as he spun out of control on the ice and hit a semi coming the other way. Um, and, and he had to live with that. And, um, and I got to know him shortly after the event and, and, uh, and attended a church where three families grieved the death of their teenage children. And it was, it was very emotional. It was very difficult for a church community. Um, but what, what's the answer? What, what's, you know, you, you know, is there a logical reason? Yes, the survivor, he actually, um, the last I knew he was pastoring a church of 3,000 people. He was a significant leader. Um, a part of his shaping was the, having to face that extremely difficult situation. Um, and yet, you know, how do you say that to, to the other families that, you know, have a hole in their, their, their heart uh, the rest of their life? Um, you know, when there is a, a death of a young person, um, it's, it's very difficult. It can motivate good things, and, and frequently there's stories of, you know, a child dies and, and the parents become involved in a cause, and, and they try to stop other children from dying in the same way if it was uh, a, a disease or if it was, uh, you know, something that's pre preventable in some mm -hmm. way. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, just because there's good that comes out of it doesn't make it good that the child died. It's, there's still an evil to that. There's still something uh, bad about it. And so, uh, so you know, it's, it's a real challenge. Yeah, know? I think we're, you're right. You're, we have to keep that balance that we cannot, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes the tendency of people is, is to look at the evil and go, oh, God can bring good out of it. Right. Uh, almost like somehow the evil itself is good. And no, evil is evil. Right. It's horrendous, you know. Um, we know that even when Lazarus had passed away and Jesus going to a tomb, uh, we're told that he wept. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is not part of what God intended for us. This is part of what we chose for ourselves, and we have brought evil and tragedy into this world. And um, mm -hmm. you know, and we're told to re to rejoice, but not not at the thing, but mm -hmm. in the midst of the thing. Right. So it's a very a very radical difference. Well, and that leads me to the next thing. You know, the fact that we are going to die, the fact that all these things are happening. How can we be joyous? How, how can we enjoy life? Well, I mean, the, the first answer from, you know, as a minister, as I say, you know, deal with your eternal life. You know, deal with the fact that, uh, that you know, people live for maybe 100 years or a little bit more at best, but then you die. And, uh, and, and faith gives answers to that. And, and Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will not die, he will live. And uh, you know, embrace that that sense of faith. And I, and and, and from my experience, and, and for me personally, knowing that I have a relationship with God, and that when I die, I go to be in the presence of God. Uh, you may say, well, that's wishful thinking, or that's my faith. Uh, it may be, but it it, it helps me live life. It, it gives me confidence. It means that you know I, I'm I'm going um, you know on a trip fairly soon. That that could be seen as dangerous in some regards, going to the Middle East. Um, and yet, I don't have to be afraid of that. Why? Because uh, worst case scenario, I don't come back, I'm in a better place. And that's, yeah. that's what I believe, that's what I teach, that's what I understand. So, um, now I'm not looking forward to going there and not coming back, that's not my point. But, uh, uh, but, but the first place to joy is, is when you feel at peace with God. And, and even that belief, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, he's he will, you know, know what is right for me. And, and if, uh, you know, if what's right for me is to live another 50 years, I'll take it. Yeah. And if it's, uh, if it's another two years, uh, that's, it is what it is. So, um, 
and, and, and eternal life is better. So uh, that's the first part, is, is dealing with your understanding of, of the afterlife. And, yeah. and, and, and the Bible addresses that, and, and Jesus died and rose again as the central issue of Christianity. He rose that we might rise after we die as well. Mm-hmm. And that's the whole Easter story. Yeah. You know, for me, there's two things definitely in mind. First of all, is that, you, you know, um, those who would mock our faith have no better alternative. True. That, uh, you know, I, I've been in discussion with atheists who try to make it sound like there can be meaning and purpose without God. Mm-hmm. And the fact is that there is no God, there is no ultimate meaning, there's no ultimate purpose. It's only what you create, it's your illusion. Mm-hmm. And when you die, that illusion dies with you. Mm-hmm. I remember a, a while back I had read a book by Jerry Walls that we've actually discussed here a number mm-hmm. of times called Good God. And I really would recommend every Christian should read that book. Uh, but one of the things I loved about it was this one passage where he said, um, when a tragedy occurs, let's say, you know, what happened in Connecticut, um, these children are killed, this horrible thing happens. Nobody ever goes and asks an atheist, hey, what, what would you say to those parents? Mm. They always go to the rabbi. They always go to the priest. They go to the minister. Mm-hmm. They never go to an atheist right. and say, what would you tell these parents who have now lost their kids? Because you have no message of hope for them. Mm-hmm. There is nothing. All you can say is, well, nature decided to eliminate them. Mm-hmm. What are you right. going to say to them? Nothing. Right. Right. And uh, that's the first thing. Second thing I always think about is that we always confuse, and this, I'm very grateful to Augustine in this sense, um, those of us who are philosophically minded. <laughs> Besides Ecclesiastes, I'm, yes. I'm grateful to Augustine because Augustine taught me to look at what is good, but what is the greatest good. Mm. And the greatest good is to know God in this life and to enjoy Him in the afterlife. Mm. That is the greatest good. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, nothing is great. That's why, you know, Jesus says, what does a man gain if he gains the whole world? Mm-hmm. Yet loses his soul. Right. He's gained nothing. He loses everything. Mm-hmm. So it, it, our perspective should be, if you know the Lord, then you can enjoy everything that God has given to us. You know, mm-hmm. like we can see that all these things are, are the beauty of God's creation. Mm-hmm. Enjoy them where you have them, but don't hold on to them like they're eternal. Right. You know, uh, and what you will have in the afterlife it will be appropriate to that existence and enjoyable within that existence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think, that, again, those things help me to realize, come on, uh, there, there, is a, there is a great joy in living that we can yes. have. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Um, you had a point to make? No, or? no, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, well, I guess we kind of answered this one, so maybe we'll go to the next one. My next question was, how does belief in heaven make a difference? But we kind of, let's touch the last one first. How does prayer help? And I know you, 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 had, uh, you, you wanted to share something with us. You, uh, you have Philippians 4, verses yeah. 5 and 6. Yeah, How does yeah. prayer help yeah. in, uh, in dealing with death and all these situations? Yeah. Um, Philippians 4 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Amen. And the peace of God, which transcends under, all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, um, you know, a verse like that really points out that, uh, and, and, and let me put it back into context. Um, you can be watching the news and become very anxious. Somebody gets murdered over there, there's a car accident over there, there's a fire over there, there's a terrorist attack somewhere else. And, and uh, human nature says, oh, you know, that could be me or that could be my family member. And, and you, you can get very anxious. Um, I think prayer is, is very important to, to bring our worries, our concerns to God. Um, you know, prayer is many things. It's, uh, it's developing a relationship with God. It's, it, it's talking to God. Yes, there are written prayers that uh, may be uh, helpful in some ways. Uh, you know, some people would say the Our Father regularly, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, and that's a very common prayer. Um, but, but I think beyond that, and, and what, what is really, um, you know, a big part of our tradition is saying, you know, we can talk to God every day. You don't have to go to church to pray. You don't have to be in a Bible study or, or with other people to pray. But, uh, but really, uh, every follower of Christ should spend a few hour, a few minutes, I said hours, a few, a few minutes every day, uh, beginning their day with prayer and maybe Bible reading, maybe a devotional thought, you know, those kind of things. Um, it really does a lot to bring peace and joy into your life. And, uh, uh, you know, this life has a lot of craziness to it. And, uh, and we may be far removed, and there may be a season where we go through uh, 
as Psalm 23 says, the valley of the shadow of death. Mm. You know, we, we go through those experiences where we have a loss or we have a grief that we have to face. Um, but, but ultimately, the importance of prayer. And, and, and from my experience as a minister, almost no one says, uh, I don't want your prayer. I mean, uh, mm. uh, you know, sometimes people joke, oh, say a prayer for me. I really, or say a prayer for him. He really needs <laughs> it. You know, that kind of thing, yeah. uh, just in, in banter. But, you know, but people appreciate uh, being prayed for. But again, it's not just for the professionals, if I can yeah. call us professional prayers, but uh, all of us can pray. And, and it does a lot to bring a sense of peace and, and, uh, and deal with the anxieties and, and, and being afraid of the future, you know. And I think with prayer, you know, one thing we can learn from the Psalms is the importance of honesty in prayer. I think yeah. that uh, um, you see the psalmists having all, 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 their, all their grieving, all their pain, Oh God, where are you? Why have you abandoned me? Don't you mm -hmm. care? Don't you? And I always tell people there's nothing wrong in praying that way, right. because you're still talking to God. Right. Right. You know the worst prayer is when you're not praying because you're 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 don't, you don't want to talk to Him, mm -hmm. you're denying Him. Right. But when you're actually even arguing with Him, you're still you're still in dialogue. You're still trying to figure out why God, why did this happen? Even if even if it's not revealed to you, at least you're trying to. To discover it, and, I, and some people, you know, some Christians shy away from that because they want almost like this kind of um, purified type prayer, sanitized that you don't dare right. question, you don't dare. And yet the Bible is open, where you see a lot of people praying in agony mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. God and saying, you know, why am I going through this? Yeah, yeah. And and really, the heart of Christianity is that uh, that there was a God, and I'll even take us back into the Garden of Eden. There was a God who created this earth and placed Adam and Eve in the garden, whether it's, uh, you know, however you want to view that. But, uh, but in the midst of that, God wanted to commune with Adam and Eve. He wanted a relationship with them. Uh, he wanted them to talk to him. And, and that's the God that we worship and serve. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we're, we're very grateful that you spend this evening with us. And certainly we um, want to make you aware of the topic. But not simply the illusion of uh, safety, but certainly the greatness of the presence of God uh, who, who has made himself uh, very tangible for us. And we pray that you'll search him out and definitely in prayer and in service to him. God bless you. Have a good evening. Thank you for watching Faith and Reason. Please join us again next week. We invite you to visit our pastors at one of their churches, Pastor Rick Spence at Fort Lee Gospel Church, or Pastor George Crespo at the First Baptist Church in Cliffside Park. Check out our websites for more information.